We are going to get into a different territory today. We are welcoming Dr. Willie Soon. He's an astrophysicist and a geoscientist, uh, an authority in the relationship between solar phenomena and global climate. Uh, in 2018, he founded the Center for Environmental Research, and uh, he has been, um, you know, another one of these voices that gets uh, silenced for daring to speak away from the orthodoxy. And of course, that immediately intrigues me. I want to see what I can learn. Although I don't have a horse in the race, I bet I'm going to learn something today. We'll get to know Dr. Soon in just a second. Also, and, and later in the hour, we have Dr. Charlie Brenner in here. He developed nicotinamide riboside. I am, if there's one supplement that you should be using, it is that one. I am crazy enthusiastic about this. And with Dr. Brenner, we're going to get into the science. That'll be in about an hour. But first, let's get to Dr. Soon. Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. So whether you have three minutes in the morning or 30 minutes to keep your face wrinkle-free, I want to introduce you to Gen 90, the new instant wrinkle cream from Genucel. Gen 90 instantly reduces the appearance of wrinkles anywhere you use it, around the eyes, the forehead, the crow's feet, the laugh lines, even the chin. It starts working in seconds. Never worry about your skin or your confidence again. Gen 90 technology is luxurious, nourishing, and silky smooth. And best of all, it starts working, as I said, in just seconds. And now you get Genucel XV, the collagen builder moisturizer with vitamin C and hyaluronic acid in a pure natural base for stunning results day after day. Our friends at Genucel have upgraded Susan's personalized skincare bundle to include their brand new Gen 90 for immediate effects at Genucel.com slash Drew. Before you go overseas to get harsh procedures for thousands of dollars, try that Gen 90 first. Order right now at Genucel.com slash Drew and you get a free luxury beauty box that includes their incredible neck treatment and free shipping that is genucel.com slash drew g-e-n-u-c-e-l.com slash d-r-e-w and as we said we're bringing dr soon in here in just a second but before i do i want to remind you that the parallel economy has empowered us to care for our own health and well-being even our longevity and for pet parents as well we now have a place to go when it comes to keeping the family dogs cats horses in the best shape possible of course, we're dog people. We're thrilled to be working with Pet Club 24-7. It's a company co-founded by two guys who lost dogs to serious conditions, including cancer. Pet Club 24-7 has an incredible array of products, including a line of healthy supplements for humans, too, such as the Inforce Plus Coriolis Versicolor with Reishi. Nonetheless, the most important in demand for dogs is called Mush Puppies. That's this one with Coriolis Versicolor. Again, mushrooms for its immune system, according to hundreds of clinical studies. Pet Club 24-7, mush puppies, also made here in the U.S. No filters, no addicting qualities. Your dog can't accidentally overdose or anything like that. Our dogs love them. Rex goes crazy for these things. The vet said, we went to the vet, asked her. She said, these are great. Mush puppies is also glucosamine, carotene, and chondroitin for joint health. Great for the old dogs here including myself. The great news is we have a Dr. Drew uh, approved deal for you. Go to drdrew.com slash pet club 24 seven for a discount. That's drdrew.com slash P E T C L U B two four seven. You can also find the link at drdrew.com slash sponsors to find those special deals. So let's get to Dr. Willie soon. As I said, he's an astrophysicist and a geoscientist. He is, um, been uh, in the middle of a little controversy around uh, registering some opinions on uh, climate change and perhaps a little counter narrative, which to me is scientific. Just the back and forth of science is a necessary feature of science. If you remember Dr. Joseph Fryman telling us about rational uncertainty, rational lack of certitude should be our position in science. Therefore, we should be entertaining all opinions. Uh, Dr. Soon got his. Uh, bachelor's and master's in science and PhD in aerospace engineering from USC. Please welcome Dr. Willie Soon. Dr. Soon, welcome. Oh, thank you. 
My my first question is how you went from uh, aerospace engineering to geophysics. Oh, okay. I, I got uh, I guess I got a fellowship at Harvard University, and after my PhD, I I reluctantly go leave the Southern California, obviously. And uh, but it's such a attractive position because there was only three people out of one hundred and seventy five people that applied got in. So I was lucky one of those. And uh, it is a very exciting time for me because I got to switch field. I was working on things called plasma physics, high temperature gases. <laughs> then I switched to study the sun. I have no clue what a sunspot is when I go to the postdoctoral fellowship. To show you how uneducated I am. But then by 10 years later, I actually wrote a semi-popular book about the sun. You know, really diving deep. Trying to explain how does the sunspot activity comes and go, why does it do so, and then if it does that, for example, a period called Vanda Minimum from 1645 to 1715, sunspot almost disappeared. Actually, it is one of those very rare 70 years period that sunspot disappeared. Mm. We can have sunspot disappear during sunspot minima, but only for you know a year, the most. This is 70 years. So that time was very unique. In fact, it happens to fall into a period called the Little Ice Age. So immediately there would be some question. Would, it, it is the Little Ice Age, which means a cold period. In fact, Little Ice Age, is, it goes from about 1300 to about 1900 AD, right? So about 14th century to about beginning of 20th century. And it's actually a long period of time in which that is, is the coldest in the last, I would say, even 10,000 years. Okay, before the little the glacial maxima. So this is a very unique period. So why and how? Indeed, that over 30 years now, I can tell you that we really, really have some evidence to show that this is something to do with the sun, obviously, which means the sun getting dimmer. Slightly dimmer, but it's sufficient enough that to trigger the whole little ice age phenomenon. And it is called little ice age because the glaciers are growing to a very large size. You know, there are there are churches in uh, Switzerland and many places where they, the, the glacier is growing. They're actually coming down the valley. I mean, trying to crush over churches and things like that. So you can imagine the prayer is very, very hard. <laughs> mm. where, where was that program again the, the, that you got the geophysics? Sorry? I, I did, you, you're, the microphone glitched a little bit when you described where that post, post, postgraduate program was. Oh. It's Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. It's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Got it. Yes. Got it. Yeah, I, I actually was there, lived I was there for one. thirty years. I was there for thirty years. Oh my goodness, thirty-two years. Yeah. I I was actually I lived with some in the seventies, early days of this discipline. I lived with some uh, plasma physicists from MIT, and uh, it, I would open their textbooks once in a while and just sort of marvel at what was going on. So th this has been a field of, and obviously that you know people are trying to create energy from this these days, and I, I understand. Um, but I, I got a million questions. Okay, let me sort of try to organize my thoughts here. First of all, I want to just get into your training a little bit. Um, how you know when I think about astrophysics, I think about gravity, and I think about fundamental sort of relationship between quantum physics and gravity right that, that people are trying to make these connections all the time that, that's where i in, interact with astrophysics uh did you get involved in that mess at all are you are, are you involved in that mess uh, or you just went down a completely no. different path right we our, our specialties at the harvard smithsonian was to study what you call the sun-like stars as you know we have only Got one it. sun and if you i mean so far we have since galileo galileo pointed the telescope 1609 or so, we have about, you know, 410 years or so, right, uh, of the data. But 410 years for, for a sun of uh, 5 billion years old is kind of nothing, right? So the yeah. idea is the first Caltech PhD did this, by the way. The first Caltech PhD, the guy by the name of Olin Wilson, go up to Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California and then decided that maybe we should map up the universe, look for the nearby stars you know, sun-like star, to study whether they have this sunspot cycle. In fact, it's, it is our project that proved beyond doubt that all the stars does have this kind of uh, information, this kind of activities. 
So it's a generalized phenomenon. And, and so you mentioned this 70-year period with uh, no sun, sunspots, but you also mentioned that something that's 400 million years old, 70 years, one year, 700 years, these are not statistically massively different units of time. Was it just a statistical variability, or was there something significant about that 70 years that you were able to learn about sunspots? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, you know, I say it's a long stretch of time, no doubt about it. But the modern minimum happened to fall into a period in which the, the coldest period during the whole little ice age is actually around 17th century. That's part of the reason. It shows you that the sun yeah. dimming sufficiently to, to provide that causal factors. In fact, causal factors is the most quintessential point about science, yes? You want to know what is causing mm. what, right? And then most of it, yeah. you are right, statistical, but <laughs> it is indeed a very difficult subject, just like people claiming that CO2 causing global warming. As far as I'm concerned, after 32 years of searching, I can find it. They can say all they want, but I like to see the evidence. This is part of the problem that uh, I'm not just simply being, you know, what you call, <laughs> just don't want to disagree with them, but I actually couldn't find the evidence myself. That's the whole problem. And then, unfortunately, most of the evidence they put out, it's all not so real, it's not so rigorous. So everyone has a hole in it, so it's not a very good explanation. In fact, we found, we found that it's most likely explained by the sun. And we have evidence to show it. We publish paper. We explain the reasons of the difference between my, our, our results versus, let's say, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. I mean, those guys are really, I call them climate gangsters. It's essentially that they don't talk about evidence. They don't want to debate. They just simply say, I am more powerful than you. You shut up, say nothing. So I'm sorry, that's not science. So however they want to put it, it is not very satisfactory. And I know that people want to you know, pick sides. I am not picking any side. I simply want science to go straight, you know, show me the evidence and explain. I mean, one of the basic problems that after 30 years of work, in fact, I just published a major paper last year, was able to show that the thermometer data that they use after all these years are contaminated by something called the urban heat island effect. No one was able to show that conclusively. I think our result achieved that status that we show that very conclusively. Now, I guess the ball is in their court. Let's see whether they can find anything wrong in our work, right? Fair enough. So I'm, I'm waiting for them to say something. Obviously, they will just try to ignore us. In fact, one of the reporters wrote an article about our work in 2021, so like three years ago, asking them, why are you not referring to Dr. Soon's work? Oh, they say because Dr. Soon's work were published, you know, like not meeting the particular deadline where they are supposed to write the IPCC report. So, I mean, IPCC, they, they use a lot of claims saying that, oh, it's the most authoritative, the most comprehensive scientific report on climate science. But unfortunately, they don't realize that when they make the statement that they, they couldn't e include my peer-reviewed published scientific papers in time to even... You know, showing that their report is already outdated the time that my paper came out. So it's a very kind of a weak statement for them to try to say that, oh, we, sh we, we can ignore his work for now because he didn't meet the time deadline for them to write the report. So it's that kind of a, what you call weak argument. So what do your, do, do your peers, in your 30 years at the Harvard program, I imagine you have a large network of peers, what do your peers say in regard to your data? Number one, do they the ones that agree? Are the, a lot of them agree? And what then do they say about the, you know, the uh, international organizations that are trying to diminish it? And the ones that disagree with you, what is their argument? I find none. Okay, let me not oversell myself because actually some of the questions you should ask them, but it is the fact that I publish all my works. You know, like it's published in peer review, it's been reviewed by any of them. It's open. Science is not like a hit and run, you know, like you punch somebody in the face and then you turn around, who hit it? Who hit me? It's not like right, that. Right, you have, right, to, you have right. to be serious. You know, you write down your evidence and then you've got to give away the data, you know, things like that. Yeah. You know, everything is open. But the problem is all this thing has been published. 
I do have a lot of, by the way, here's a problem. Climate science has become so utterly corrupted that it become a real mm. serious problem. I mean, from the Nobel Prize Foundation, from the National Academy of Sciences, sorry for me to be so daring, you know, who is really soon to criticize all this big body. But unfortunately, they are all become anti-science group because they simply refuse to engage in science. Every single time when I say, here's the paper, here's our work, can we discuss this? None of them want to discuss all of this. But we, you know, we, but our paper has been published. So we keep doing more and more work, more and more work to clarify that, you know, why we are right, you know, or why we are wrong, things like that. So what I'm trying to say is that science is, is a live document. It's a living document. We continue to try to put out work, right? And, uh, mm. so I have to say that I'm waiting for them to challenge me directly. And, and I can tell you honestly, Dr. Drew. If they found anything wrong in my argument, I'll just say, yeah, I'm wrong. You know, big deal. But the well, that's the is, that's the science, right? You're, I'm, yes. I'm sure you're used to that, right? You're used to uh, yeah. people attacking your work because that is the nature of the scientific process. You, you, yeah. you, 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 it's called scientific scrutiny. You withstand scientific scrutiny. You, you, you respond to the criticism. You try to refine your position by virtue of the criticisms that come your way. Yes, I think you got it. I mean, you understand science, but the problem is that those yeah. guys don't, they are not engaged in science. You understand all their behavior. I mean, you, you ask well, them for you, data. Yeah, I they do say, know, oh, I shouldn't I, give you the data. I, <laughs> Yeah, listen, I, I opened up by talking about irrational certitude. Uh, science yeah. is the opposite of irrational certitude. It's rational uncer incertitude, lack of certainty, constantly revising our point of view. And it's it's all actually alarming to me because what you're describing is the same thing going on in the medical sciences, the CDC, some of the some of the major journals, the same exact and you know, you tell me if you're seeing this in your discipline. The first thing I noticed in the scientific literature is it all only goes one direction. And in my entire career, I've never seen science only go one way. All the all the major journal publications only go one way. That's that just fall. It can't be. It just that's not how science is. We're trying no, to get yes. to a theoretical frame. Go ahead. Right. For for climate science, it's all about CO2 causing all this thing. It's just ridiculous. I mean, they are actually considering CO2 to be that knob, the thermometer, thermostat for the planet Earth. Turning left will be cooling it. Turning up will be warming it. But climate system is such a complex thing with so many variables, you know, with even geology involved with, with long time scale, short time scale event. Even the fundamental question about what is the weather and climate is never been resolved. There's a more formal definition. The World Meteorological Organization likes to say that climate is the 30-year average of weather. But, you know, mm. you can ask the question, why 30 years? There's no such yeah. thing. There is absolutely no such thing. You see, then they say, I'm the authority. Oh, you cannot challenge me. Things like that. Oh, that's not a scientific discussion. Okay, you can say that. Good luck to you. In fact, I'll give you a, a round of applause for being so brilliant. This is what they do. Guys like Al Gore, guys like Greta Thunberg, guys like all these third-rate scientists, oh, quite a lot of them, actually. I can even mention names. I mean, one guy, presidential science advisor, John Holdren. I mean, they're talking trash every day. All the things that they talk about, like they say, oh, global warming causing extreme weather, but they can never explain it. And the, the extreme weather means that it's also extra snowstorm and things like that. They, they, they cannot explain all this phenomenon that is against the narrative. And then they keep spewing out all these irrational kind of uh, uh, excuses and justification and all this post hoc explanation between after the event. They never try to make some kind of forecast with the realistic hypothesis and then trying to see that whether, okay, I'm proven or disproven. They never function as a science. That's the problem. So by now, I would say that this CO2 global warming is only an idea. It's nowhere close to being a theory or an hypothesis. This is part of the problem that I've had with them for a very long time. In fact, all the statement that I, 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 you know, that I make here, it's all been published. Actually, I publish all these papers everywhere. 
to try to express my perspective and bring in evidence, scientific evidence, you know, to show, you know, what is what. Uh, and you, this is why you, you it's said so it's ne neither. I, I get it. And, and I want to, I got a lot of questions, but the, the, the issue of, you mentioned it's neither hypothesis nor theory. Would you explain to people why that's an important construct? It's the basic of the scientific method. Yes. The reason why it's important that when you make a statement, it better be something that it can be verified and checked and all that stuff or disproven, you know, to be wrong. This is actually some of the science philosopher. The most famous one is the, the Karl Popper. Popper, you know, the guy from England who always makes to say that science is about refutation, refutation that if you can prove your theory is wrong, you know, that is a level of science. Because all of these guys, all they say CO2, CO2 causing global warming can never be proven to be wrong. And then they simply use word. They say CO2 is a greenhouse gas, but they don't, don't try to explain how the CO2 operates in the infrared, the long wave radiation. How does it interact in the system, right? Causing, let's say, cloud to change or causing, I don't know, uh, ocean to warm. For example, I, I challenge a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Stephen Chu. He's, uh, he's also a secretary of energy who made the claim that rising carbon dioxide will drastically melt the Greenland ice sheets. And I asked uh, Professor Chu, what, uh, Professor Chu, why don't why don't you try? You you are a physicist. By the way, he got his Nobel Prize for laser confinement. So <laughs> why don't we shine a, a carbon dioxide laser, like 15 micro wavelength? You know, that means it's in the infrared. Try to see that we can melt an ice cube, isn't it? I, I <laughs> challenge him, actually. This is the problem. This infrared radiation is not doing any such thing. When he make that kind of claim, it ought to be challenged, right? It's a nonsense, actually. By mm -hmm. the way, when we say the sun is causing global warming, well, have a sunlight, which is in a visible sunlight. Yes, sunlight, if you, you put a regular light radiation, it would melt uh, the ice, isn't it? Things like that. And then you will penetrate mm -hmm. certain deep, deeper layer of the ocean, which is actually the where all the energy resides, right? And then infrared radiation, it doesn't even go to a skin layer. Micron, you know, micrometer, 10 to the minus 6 meter. <laughs> That's how small the effects can be. And and part of that problem is that these people are not willing to engage in that kind of discussion, obviously. And you mentioned Carrie, and I guess Podesta now is in the mix. What 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 is their what is their who is in their ears? Oh, I have no idea. All I know is that my my good friend, uh, Professor Richard Linson from MIT, that's retired now. He called them the average D student. <laughs> this is the revenge of the average D student. They don't want to learn science. They never are good in science. They don't want to learn about numbers. And all they do is basically spewing this dogma, you know, just basically re recycling information. I mean, El Gore is one of the number one guy who actually are all constantly using his political power to force scientists to make statements that is not supposed to be true. I know a lot of this detail. For example, in, in about 2006 or so, he forced a, a scientist, a scientist from postgraduate naval research, I think it's in Monterey, California, to try to make a statement that Arctic sea ice was all melt away in like 2012. Okay. Uh, so can you, do we, have we seen the Arctic sea ice all melted away? He forced the, the, right. the scientist to kind of make those kind of computer scenario. You understand? It's a computer game yeah. using a computer feeling that it's going to melt. Yeah, you can do that, but yeah. if you change up the, the the numbers that they use, is not realistic. This is part of the problem. That's not science. Mm. And the computer model, it never works. All the computer climate mm. model, they always don't want to talk about now. By the way, that's another typical strategy. They don't talk about now because mm. they say, oh, all we worry about is the future. Future increase of the CO2, right? Mm. And then it's going to melt the ice, the green on ice sheet, melt even Antarctica you know, uh, cause polar bear to go uh, extinct, you know, have hurricane increased intensity. All of those things has been proven to be wrong because increasing carbon dioxide is not going to change the intensity of the hurricane. They created a lot of fake things. I don't know, you saw a lot of fake news. They say they want to call hurricane category six because they have no more skills. It's complete baloney, these people. I mean, it's <coughs> really, really bad stuff. No, and they make use. By the way, a lot of this is a collusion of politician 
and a bit of those uh, what you call mad, bad scientists plus media. These three golden triangle is extremely potent in terms of spreading misinformation and disinformation. And then they don't allow any other dissent, any other question. And I am actually been doing this for a long time, by the way. So I was never always go along with them. I used to kind of play a little bit because you kind of have to, you know, you go to NASA proposal review meeting. You try to be pleasant, but you always ask questions. That's what science is all about. I get into science not to get rich or get famous or anything. I get into science because I want to learn. Only want the truth and nothing mm. but the whole truth. This is what the problem is. These people are never, never interested in science. That's the problem. And I, I really have a hard time dealing with these people. All I have to do is that I, I kind of uh, try to have debate with them many times. There's never a time that they're willing to debate you in public, things like that. So I've tried so many ways of doing things. Nothing works. By the way, I just got invited to debate uh, Professor Robert Sokolow at Princeton in fall. So that should be very interesting. But uh, again, it's a mismatch. He's a professor dealing with energy policy. And he wants to have the policy to cut carbon dioxide, but he doesn't want to know that whether CO2 causes global warming. Think about the the, mm. the kind of... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's such a detachment, you know, like separate from reality. Well, if CO2 mm. is not causing global warming, then why are we cutting CO2? I've been always asking that question. And what's yet the most important point I have to say, no matter how many times you say it, CO2 is plant food. It's actually gas of life, right? If you cut CO2, yep. I am quite sure the biological kingdom will be harmed, okay? And yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. And they don't want to be. I asked Elko a question. I say, yes, even if I'm willing to swallow all, all my saliva right now <laughs> and say that, okay, you're right, Elko, you're cool, you're okay. But tell me, why are you cutting CO2 emissions? When you change the temperature of the globe, first of all, I don't think you can show that, okay? Absolutely no evidence. Then, what if you half, uh, harm all the biological kingdom? Why, what if you turn all the desert area into complete wasteland? Why, you know, what if you do all of that? And who will be responsible for this kind of, uh, 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 idea that you are proposing? I mean, they have no answer. They have no answer. And Al Gore tried to invoke his, his moral authority. He said, oh, the chance to save human civilization. And I answered, me too. <laughs> One of the reasons why I'm in this is that also, I want to say, make sure that science is straight. These people are always yes. having all this ulterior motive. He, he wants to change our energy infrastructure, but he doesn't propose any alternative solution. This is part of the problem. If I may quote one more, is uh, my favorite uh, physicist of all time is Professor Freeman Dyson, the guy from uh, Princeton. His name card is behind me. But Professor Freeman Dyson is saying that uh, CO2 is a gift of life. We should thank China. He said, oh, for burning coal and then giving us CO2. I'm sorry, it may sound a bit extreme, but he's a very deep thinker. He's a very, very deep thinker. He said that we, he's afraid that China might want to charge us money later because because of the CO2, the free service. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to give the essence. This CO2 is something very, very good for the system. And these people are just yeah. misusing it, misusing it. So we have to take a little break here. Dr. Willie Soon is with us. Oh. And uh, for those of you that don't know the, the basics of uh, ecosystems, uh, what Dr. Soon is talking about is CO2 is pulled out of the air by plants and uh, combined with water and made into glucose essentially yes through photosynthesis uh, and that becomes the primary production of food sources for the car for the herbivores and then the carnivores eat the herbivores and now we have our food kingdom essentially but you have to have those primary producers and primary producers tend to determine the amount of biomatter, let's say, that survives on the planet. So let's take a little break. Uh, also, when we get back, there have been some extreme phone outages throughout the country, and this may have been connected to, well, I'm going to ask you, are this, is this connected to solar flares? What do you think? We'll be right back after this. 
Are you one of the millions of American women and men dealing with premature hair thinning and hair loss? Or maybe you're scared about inheriting that thinning look because it runs in your family? Start 2024 with a real solution that delivers results without the harsh side effects or unwanted chemicals and no need for prescription. Provia uses a safe natural ingredient, Procapil, to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and hair loss. By supporting healthy scalp circulation, the delivery of nourishing nutrients, and healthy hair follicle anchoring to your scalp, Provia guarantees more hair on your head than in the shower or on your comb. Right now, new customers save over 50% plus free shipping. Every introductory package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia serum for daily use, plus the Provia Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. Don't wait. Order now to save an extra 10% and get free shipping at ProviaHair.com forward slash Drew. That's P-R-O-V-I-A-H-A-I-R, ProviaHair.com slash D-R-E-W. As a physician, I am deeply concerned about efforts to erode the doctor-patient relationship. And as medical freedom continues to come under assault, I'm on a mission to empower you to be able to take care of yourselves and your family the way you want to. I urge you to get this medical emergency kit from The Wellness Company. It contains essential prescription medication you should really always have on hand. Here's Dr. Peter McCullough, Chief Scientific Officer. It's a very broad and diverse medical kit. can handle everything from a urinary tract infection, a fungal infection, a bronchitis. People can, you know, via telemedicine, uh, get their questions answered and get on the right track. But it's basically an at-home formula. For the first time, people, instead of being... Uh, uh, held captive by an urgent care or by a doctor's office or an ER, they can actually do this themselves at home. Save yourself the weight and the hassle and feel better faster. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off. That is drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off the medical emergency kit. And as I said yesterday, we were going to have the uh, travel kits. Uh, they are essential for travel. We really have everything covered on those kits. Uh, we have first aid kits too now as well. And more stuff coming. We'll keep your eyes out. We've got some very interesting things coming your way. Dr. Willie Soon is with us, astrophysicist, um, the famous for studying the sun uh, in a little bit of controversy around climate change. And before the break, I asked whether or not he thought the phone outages that have uh, been across the country had anything to do with solar flares. Is that possible? Well, clearly, solar flare is possible to to do all of that. No doubt about it. But for this particular event, it turns out that uh, maybe not because uh, we do see a blackout, a radio wave blackout. But the radio wave blackout occurs for this particular event. It's about 3 to 30 megahertz. So it's that kind of wave and uh, the typical cellular network is only from 600 to 2,000 megahertz, so it's a different wavelength. And then if you talk about 5G, it's 3 to 4 gigahertz, so it's, it's not in the same regime. Mm. But it is true that yesterday mm. there were two back-to-back. Within seven hours, there were two x classes solar flare, and they're very energetic. In fact, one solar flare typically can be compared to up to a few hundred million to a billion of the atomic bomb. So it's very powerful in that sense. Mm. But unfortunately, a, a lot of this thing, it has to be very specific to hit the Earth. I mean, I mean, we always have very large solar flare events, highly energetic one. That, but then most of the time, they blow out somewhere else into space. They're not hitting us. For this particular event, it did. It did came because it's about sun facing. It's about to come straight to us. And it did come to us. We saw the event. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I think not much else can be said about it. Probably that the uh, AT&T company ought to explain what happened. It, it might be some kind of a, <laughs> some kind of internal thing that they were doing. And some people are talking about a lot of this conspiracy story, obviously. So, uh, mm. so I, I, I have no other opinion on that. All I know is that solar flare is a phenomenon that we ought to study and be prepared for. In fact, I'm very fed up also with a lot of this lack of preparedness because some of this solar flare and what, and then another type of name called corona mass ejection. These are huge amount of plasma broid that come and then facing the earth and really will disrupt a lot of events on the, on the, on earth. And that will cause a lot of problem. You can even fry, you know, the electricity, your electricity grid and things like that. It happened many times in the history. 1989 was a very famous event, right? And if we don't have anything prepared for it, then we'll be in serious trouble because some of this large event is clearly imminent and possible. And we have seen that. Do we have, 
Is there any biological risk from some of the, is, or is there a potential or even theoretical biological risk? There always is such a thing. I mean, like higher x-ray event, but, but most of the time, if mm. you put a piece of cloth, I mean, that is enough to even show a lot of this radiation problem. But what we worry okay. more is about the charged particle, the electric char charge particle, you know, like electrons and protons and, and even helium yeah. nuclei, you know, the nuclei of the helium. Comes flying our way. So let me ask you this: it, Are we getting warmer uh, in in the in the globe, uh, or can we even tell? But let's you know, let's let's say you decide it's true. Uh, what's the sun's role in all that? Oh, uh, all you have to do is actually come to my uh, website, right? Series that sign dot com, c e r e s dash sign dot com, <laughs> where we have a few of a new paper that we just published. We basically explain that. Uh, the way to look at this problem is that to try to get the best measurements of the, what you call temperature of the earth. The old temperature curve that the uh, IPCC, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and, and Al Gore and a bunch of those people use are temperature record that is contaminated by urban heat island effect. So we actually say that why don't we take away all the urban data and only look at the rural station data? And what we show is that the rural station data is, is actually have a character of warming and cooling, warming and cooling, more cyclical, more like an oscillation, mm. come warming and cooling mm. every 50, 60 years or so. And then if we show that with the best estimate of the sun, yes, it shows that it fit. So now we throw the ball back to them. Can you explain this? You know, because we show that if you try to fit this with a CO2, it doesn't work because Especially one, one is very well known is that from 1940s to about 1970, remember at that time, the CO2 continued to rise, CO2 concentration. But how does the temperature cool? Does that mean that rising carbon dioxide causing the temperature to cool? I mean, just because mm. that you have one phase of the, from 70 to now that is warming and then you have rising CO2, it's just one, right? Because from 1900 to 1940, there was barely no CO2 change. So it, it is CO2 idea is not working very well. That's part of the problem. This is why I work very hard, not because I want to prove that the sun is doing that, but I want to seek the alternative explanation because it's not satisfactory. The explanation they offer about CO2 is just don't even cut it. I mean, that's the problem. So they, they score basically 30% yeah, in the you, test. I mean, I want a 100% kind of test, you're, you know? You're, I, I, I'm not that kind of weak student that I just want to get 30% and then pound on my chest say that, oh, I'm so smart. Mommy, mommy, I got A. No, 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 no. I want to score. A means 100% or 90% at least, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, but it is, after all, the revenge of the D students, as you pointed out earlier. So uh, what right. is your theory? <laughs> <laughs> what is your theory about what do you imagine is happening to science. This is a thought I, I have all the time. I'm trying to figure out what what has happened here. Did we not educate people in science properly? Did has a centralization of authority just overridden the practice of science? Are people afraid? Is there a mass formation psychosis? What's what's going on? In why has science been seemingly so adulterated? I can't explain it. I really cannot explain it, but I am disappointed for sure. I mean, the, 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 the flow of information of science even now has been interrupted in a very clear way, as you imagine. Because, I mean, I just published a very important uh, report today on my website, on our, our series that science.com website, which is to show that Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, these are all, if you count the number, it's close to 6 billion active users monthly. They are actively blocking the interview that I did with Tucker Carlson a month ago and don't allow any clips of it, they at least put something to block it. And then the way they do that is that they, they basically give the authority to a group called Science Feedback. Which means science feedback wrote an article saying, oh, Willie Soon is wrong on A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then we answer A, B, C, D, E, F, G, till Z. So we go, we go five times longer than them and explain everything in full detail. 
So I really encourage people if they're concerned about science, somebody got to send in comments and, 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 and I guess complain that they ought not to try to use this sort of uh, censorship to try to control flow of information. Because I have always been willing to discuss science with anyone, anytime, any day. So <laughs> in that sense, Science is highly corrupted. It's funding. It's the funding of science that is a primary problem in that sense because people keep claiming that all funding from taxpayer, they like to say government funding is, is a healthy thing. I say, hell no, it's not. And then never mind that mm. funding from pharmaceutical is also not very healthy. In fact, somebody just sent an email to me asking me if I want to do some work if I get some funding from Pfizer. I said, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, things like so, that. So, um, uh, let, let's assume that you know we have pretty good reach here, and we get through. We're able to sort of reach people through some of these censorship uh, blockades. Um, right. And uh, before we wrap things up here, you and I, what is it you want people to know that they would have heard had Facebook or Instagram not blocked you? Well, they should first understand that there are some of this censorship actively going on. I'm sure they see that in COVID-19 information and things like that. By the way, we are also actively publishing on COVID-19 also. And I, in terms of the peer review, we know is only people that is saying that narrative would be allowed to publish. And then ours will take extra long, which I don't mind, by the way, I, I'm always here. So all I care is good science. What I really want people to know is indeed, we are doing the best we can. And the whole system now is really broken in a very serious way on climate science. Because now there's just no no one, you are not allowed to dissent. You're not allowed to even share data. You're not allowed to even ask them for data. Data that we pay for is actually taxpayer. So they are, they are playing all kinds of tricks. They either hide it somewhere and take a long time and then you all have to be so persistent that you keep asking that every few weeks, which is like a nanny watching a little kid. So it's such a bad thing in that sense. Yeah, overall, I, th I think that people should, maybe the first stop will be to come to uh, series-sign.com, C-E-R-E-S-Sign.com. So please come by and then we have a lot of information and hopefully that you can start from there, especially on climate science. I'm not proclaiming that we know everything, but we have the best, what you call, collection of all the information there. And that is at series, C-E-R-E-S dash science dot com. You can also follow on YouTube at series science, excuse me, series science, one word, 6032. So at series science. So there's two S's there, C-E-R-E-S-S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, 6032. And one last question for me. Um, I have a question too. When you, you keep saying we, okay. You keep saying we and us. Who is in the we and us uh, that you're describing. I, I haven't heard who's oh, in there. Oh, okay. In fact, I would encourage you to invite my colleague, Dr. Ronan Connolly, especially, because we have published a very powerful work on uh, COVID-19, by the way. So we, we study seasonality in the human coronaviruses and we show that it match, you know, all the activities and events in Northern Europe, more so than any of this intervention, like vaccine or, or, or mask or, or lockdown, things like that. So we're able to demonstrate, we publish a new paper on that. So, yeah, so, yeah, my, my two other colleagues, Dr. Michael Connolly and Dr. Ronan Connolly, they are father and son, and then myself. Mm. So three of us are basically the key guy. And then I can tell you that we work to close to at least a hundred different scientists from all over the world. So, you know, mm. basically they give me data and things like that. And then we share our computer program, things like that, you know. So it, it, there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us. My yeah. group is very, very small. So we need donation. But then, you know, we are very small, but then we are very powerful in that sense because we keep publishing paper that is of high caliber that, in fact, IPCC have no answer for. I mean, they are the one who actually keep saying they are the authority on science. I mean, I, by the way, there's no such thing as authority on science. I, I want people to be assured right. of that. That's right. That's, no such thing. That's right. That's right. Caleb. Uh, Dr. Soon, so we're talking about the, I, I guess, solar flares are a big topic today right now, especially with all the phone outages and people assuming that those might be connected. Does this mean anything to you that there was a apparently a solar flare? It was a 6.37, 6.3, maybe about 45 minutes ago. Is there some sort of a weird pattern happening or is there, because they're saying there are like 3x level solar flares in the past 24 hours and this one happened about 45 wow, minutes ago. 
Wow, this is exciting. Yeah, real time, 6.3. I didn't know about this one because we have the 1.7 and 1.9, two days, uh, seven hours now, another big one. And this is from the same region, the AR13590. Oh, by the way, we memorized those. It's called active region. Inside this region, actually, is about five times the size of the Earth, this particular bright place, that big. So this shows you that this particular region is very, very active. By the way, you get solar flare because you have a... Uh, Opposing charges, these are all plasma, right? Magnetic field, they meet together and then the energy go nowhere. They have to release the energy in a very small confinement of volume of space. That's why it's so energetic. Like I say, one of these explosions is of the order of a, even a billion atomic bomb of, a, you know, of Hiroshima, things like that. So it's highly energetic. Wow. By the way, the question to ask is that can it get higher? Can, that, can the sun be even stronger? The answer is that Yes, it can be even a thousand and a million times bigger. That's the number that we want. That's what we do physics. We want to constrain the number. And that's the one that we have to really worry about and keep in mind that we have to be ready on Earth in case we have one of these events. You can shut down the satellite, but we don't want to have problem with our electric grid, actually. That's the most important thing to protect because that's the one that one of the electric grid, if you don't prepare for it, you'll be out for two months, three months, okay? And then mm. plus that most of us don't even make those transformers anymore, all from China, so we're in trouble. So <laughs> we better so, be prepared. How unusual is it to have these three X class in the past, I bless it, this past 48 hours, to have three of these, and they almost seem to be getting stronger and stronger as time goes on. Is that unusual, or does this happen frequently every few years? I, I think it, I'm sure it happened before, but this particular one, X6.7 is quite, quite large, actually, because the scale of this thing is jumped by fact factor of 10 each time so it's very very large this one <laughs> wow i never see a caleb you're yet. you're 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 Kayla, you better you better shelter in place my friend that's what you gotta do run <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's wild yeah run thanks for the uh, Quick, no, that's, where, that's, no that's, where's some tin for it, tin for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a faraday cage no it's a faraday cage you can protect him <laughs> No, so actually, where that's actually flow, a smart so idea. Yeah, yeah, patient, a Faraday cage idea. My patients yeah. are on to yeah. something, just not on your head, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> all right. Well, that soon it's been right. it's been a, a, an interesting ride. We will all go to take a look at some of your publications. I I, I am all Thanks. about uh, dissent in science and discourse and refinement, and I appreciate you fighting the good fight because it is the scientific method. And uh, it's it's just been a very odd time when publications go one direction. Right. You right. just know immediately something something is wrong. There's literally literally nothing in science that goes only one way. So uh, thank you for all that, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. You got it. That's really soon, everybody. So we're going to switch gears. We're going to flip into biology. And what's that, Susan? What's that? That was good. You like that? <laughs> I th it's way over my head. Uh, like it, I don't know. I but I'm glad. You know. It was interesting. It was very interesting. Uh, but we're gonna switch to biology, okay? Uh, and rather than there being, um, I, I'm going right to the source this time in in terms of the science on this particular matter. It is Dr. Charlie Brenner. Chromadex is the company. You can find out more Chromadex ch. R O M A D E X dot com. Uh, you can also follow. Oh no! You can also yes. You can also follow at Chromadex on X. True Niagen is the product that's spelled T R U N I G E N. You can follow that at TrueNiagen dot com or True Niagen on X, Facebook uh, slash Chromadex. And uh, I have interviewed Dr. Brenner before. I was thoroughly convinced the first time I interviewed him that this was breakthrough. Uh, biological sciences, and I have been on his supplement ever since. And so please welcome Dr. Charlie Brenner. So there we are. Oh, no, we've, uh, you're muted for some reason. Not it's, a problem. Uh, okay, we've got to figure There it we out. are. You're back. Yeah. Great to see uh, you. But I, I don't work for, uh, for Chromadex. I'm, a, I'm the um, Alfred Mann Family Foundation Chair of Diabetes and Cancer metabolism at City of Hope. So I'm the oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah, I'm the chief advisor for Chromadex and discover the vitamin activity of nicotinamide riboside NR. Um, but I run a, an academic lab uh, here in LA County. Well, welcome. Uh, and how long do? Did you remember our first conversation together? I, I swear to God, it was like at least 10, 15 years ago, right? 
No, when you first probably had more run like into this. five or six. I was living in Iowa I like City. That was I, was... The, I feel like that was the second in time we talked together. I feel like I've really? been under Trunajan for about a, about a decade. But anyway, keep going. Really? Um, yeah, I was yeah. the head of the biochemistry department at University of Iowa from 2009 yeah, to 2020. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. came here to, to City of Hope to continue my research program. So t just give them a, a sketch, if you would, of how you ran into NR. I guess we have to you know, really break it down. You know, why is NED important metabolism? Yeah. How does it relate to cell health and aging? And how did you run into NR? And why is NR superior to some of these other ways of getting at the NAD system? Sure, sure. Well, the thing is that NAD is the central catalyst of metabolism. You know, we, we, we had a, a sun expert on here earlier and, uh, you even pointed out, you know, the, the, the biggest picture of ecology, right? Is that the sun hits the planet, right? And plants grow and then animals come along and eat the plants. And then we either eat the plants directly or we eat the animals that eat the plants. And the center of the metabolism that allows the conversion of food into energy is NAD coenzymes. And um, NAD coenzymes are also required for us to build and repair our bodies to maintain homeostasis. And NAD gets disturbed um, in the aging process and as we're exposed to conditions of metabolic stress. And so that's the use case for taking NAD boosting vitamins, of which NR is the superior form. So talk a little bit about how NAD works in the system. It's, the, it's, the, it's determining the oxidative state of the cell, right? But it's also driving and being driven from metabolism. Right. Um, there are these four different NAD coenzymes. Um, we, don't have to, we don't have the, the whiteboard here, so we won't go too deep right. into it. But NAD is basically an electron carrier. So if you picture... Uh, you know, an electric car or even an electric toaster that's plugged into the wall. Um, these are devices that are run that run on high energy electrons. Living things run on high energy electrons as well. We don't have copper wiring to carry the electrons. Instead, we have NAD coenzymes. So the NAD coenzymes basically pick up um, electrons from the food that we eat, and then they we use them to generate ATP. And then we use those high energy electrons to make nucleotides and lipids and to repair cells and to repair DNA. You can't live without them. And any the and, NAD and I system, kind of think of it I kind of think of it also as, you know, it it's sort of the necessary ingredient to to I'm gonna use a broad term, sort of anabolism or building, right? Yes. It, would that be would that be a necessary? Okay, and, and, and by the same token, yep. right? And, and by the same token, if you go too far the other way in the NAD, NADH, NAD, NADPH system, you're actually in a state that accelerates breakdown, right? Yeah. Well, it it turns out that ten different conditions of metabolic stress disturb the NAD system, right? So. Um, we can't live without oxygen. We don't enjoy life very much without sunlight. And um, we can't live without food. And a lot of people have alcohol in their life. I always say, you know, if we were to uh, have a giveaway on this program and offer people a free trip to Ibiza, right? Everybody would enter, right? And they would, they mm -hmm. would jump in a plane and have a time zone disruption, right? Then they'd be mm -hmm. out in the, in the beautiful sunlight and uh, they'd be eating and drinking at all hours of the day, listening to uh, loud music maybe on the beach. All of those things, uh, the sunlight, the oxygen exposure, certainly the alcohol, overnutrition and noise disturb the NAD system. And so... In the course of our life, we experience conditions of metabolic stress that disturb the NAD system. Taking a supplement basically allows your cells and tissues to repair 
and to be resilient in the face of these conditions of metabolic stress. And I think people have heard of NAD infusions and, you know, Joe Rogan has been very public about this. In interestingly, you, uh, you, I, you and I talking off the record, we're talking about NAD system and, uh, and COVID at one point. And it's interesting that Joe's doctor did two, two back-to-back -back NAD infusions on him when he got COVID. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Um, I Go ahead. Yeah. So two, late 2020, um, when uh, we basically, you know, looked at e each other in the laboratory in March of 2020 and um, realized that we had some data on coronavirus infection. So at the time I was at the University of Iowa, uh, one flight of stairs down from me was one of the few coronavirus labs in the United States. And so we wow. had already looked at the effect of a mouse, um, you know, hepatitis system. virus causing coronavirus um, on the NAD system. We'd already shown that coronaviruses turn on five different NAD dependent enzymes that almost no one had ever heard of attack cellular NAD and thereby damage the innate immune system's ability to fight viruses. So it turns out that viral infection and inflammation attack the NAD system and mm -hmm. that we were able to show in this paper published in JBC in 2020, that boosting um, with nicotinamide riboside, you know, enhanced the innate immune response to coronavirus infection. People read this paper. There have been four or five initiated clinical trials, one or two completed. One of them was done in Sweden and Turkey. It was a phase two, phase three that showed that NR in combination with three other over-the-counter supplements accelerated time to recovery from covid but you know this is an which, evidence which three I'm just approach. curious yeah which three um i think they were you i'm not sure that the others were really important in the activity um i think one of them was leucine which i don't quite understand why that that would be used Th but that's a, um, you know the those valine leucine antiviral stuff's been around for a long time long time yeah, so so in in this case, we understand what NR would be doing. NR would be allowing these five members of the PARP superfamily to work better in the face of this attack that um, happened. So mm -hmm. the cells see double stranded RNA as a threat, and they mm -hmm. activate the system. And your innate immune system is using NAD to fight off a virus. Other than, uh, and I think this is my last metabolism question before I get to NR specifically, uh, mm -hmm. other than sort of uh, helping be anabolic, um, what else is, I guess I'm asking, what, what is the direct relationship between AD and aging? Right. So so there's there's increasing evidence that as we age, that our NAD system comes under attack. It's not entirely clear whether it's a timer or you know, aggravated by inactivity and, you know, infl inflammatory processes, but NAD declines in aging. And so that's, again, that's part of the use case that NAD is critically important for life and particularly for, for healthy aging. And uh, we think that NR is, you know, the most effective NAD booster. It's also the, the one that's sort of fully legal, known to be safe, and is you know produced yeah. by a, a company that that cares about safety and quality. As God is my witness, if I had access to only one supplement, NR would be that supplement. I, I'm just so enthusiastic about it. I can't even. I, I the fact that it's not more widely used and distributed, I, I just can't get over it. I, I want to be a part of it being being used widely. I finally well, I got Susan. That. I mean, it's only taking it twenty right years in? ago. Yep. I mean, twenty years but ago. But I think we, I need more. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20 years, years ago, ago, we had our first paper on on the discovery of the NR pathway. And um, yeah. then, you know, within 
10 years, you know, it had kind of graduated out of the, the mouse system and, um, you know, folks at Chromadex figured out how to scale up the, the synthesis. They licensed the IP from Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. And so everything was done the mm -hmm. right way. You know, it was safety tested, yeah. established as a new dietary ingredient and got the generally regarded as safe designation. And so, you know, I'm, I'm proud that, you know, this company did, did things the right way. I'm still a little unclear on dosing, and I know you guys have IV therapies coming along. Where, where are we with that? Um, I have no no information into into the IV. So NR is orally available. That's the thing, and and safety safety tested. You know, in, in that manner, there cl the clinical dose is you know a gram a day, right? And the initial consumer dose was three hundred milligrams. But if you look at the eighty you know, registered clinical trials, almost all of them are using one to two grams of, of NR per day. And, and we know it's safe. I need more. I need more true niogen. I'm going to be taking three or four. I, 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 I've had a feeling I should be taking at least 600 milligrams and I've been taking either the fives or two. I think the, I'm two, taking 200 two or something. Threes. Yeah. We got to, we got to juice that up. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, and and then how? I guess we have to ask now. So why NR and why not NMN? Right. So NR is the biggest piece of NAD that can get into cells. Um, you know, I guess I guess we should thank you know David Sinclair for popularizing NAD. Um, he's gotten people to to take NMN. So. That's good, but NMN is just delivering NR because NMN has a phosphate on it that can't get into cells. And um, there have been some people that, you know, promoted the idea that there is a transporter for NMN. There really isn't. Um, there's mm -hmm. also not a safety path for NMN because NMN is being tested as a drug. So it's not approved as a new dietary ingredient. Companies that are selling it don't really care about you know, what is in, in the bottle and are kind of like, mm. you know, uh, doing so in violation of, of, of some of the laws. So, um, you know, mm. niogen, which is the um, form of, of NR that was developed by Chromadex, is the, is the best and the only fully legal form of NR. And this is really the gold standard for NAD boosting uh, vitamins. And would you, is, do you have sort of recommendations? In other words, so we're somewhere between 500 and 1,000 just forever. Is that, is that the plan? And uh, at what age do we start? That kind of thing. Um, I mean, there, there are ball players that start at 20, right? So um, very early on, we were contacted by a number of, um, you know, pro uh, football coaches. Um, you know, both both two two Chromadex advisors, Rudy uh, Tanzi and myself, have been photographed with with Bill Belichick, who, as you know, um, had a, a long career with the Patriots. Um, and um, so, the use case for athletes is that they're in collision sport, right? And the stress, um, they're yeah, getting the stressed, yeah. right? They're getting beat up on uh, on a yeah. Sunday. They got to go back to practice on a Tuesday and. You know, they might be playing on a, you know, on a, at this point, they may be playing on a Monday night and then, and then on a, or a Thursday and then, and then another Sunday. So, so they, they are in a line of work in which there's a lot of repair. Um, I think that as we age, the use cases for, for um, something like NR that boosts repair are obvious to people. That, you know, when you um, fall and have a cut or scrape or a mild burn, um, people that are that are taking Niagen notice that their repair occurs much more rapidly. Um, this is now the subject of a randomized clinical trials in order to, you know, establish claims in, in, in this regard. As you know, it's it's sold as a uh, supplement. And so it says on the label that it's not intended to treat, you know, diseases and conditions. We're also very interested 
in having it tested in those disease and conditions um, in small yeah. trials of Parkinson's. There's been a positive signal um, in seven different trials. There's an anti-inflammatory signal in human beings. And so we're really excited mm. about the potential uses in, in medicine. But as for now, it's it's healthy aging and promoting repair. Yeah, I I I want to I want to be able to push it out through my website. I just am such an enthusiast about about this product. And to people to get it now, they just go to just look up like Amazon True Niagen or Google True Niagen, yep. something like that. That's right. Yep. T r u n i g e n. I just think this. And is we a, may be getting our own like link with you know the great. special link great. for drdo.com. We'll so get some discount. we'll let you know when that I could comes. use that too. So yeah, it is. Uh, I I just I just I, there's few things I can say with such great enthusiasm and clarity as as this. That and not only is it not going to harm you, I am convinced there are significant benefits. And the way longevity is, and the way aging is, the earlier you start, really the better. I mean, certainly in your 40s, because the aging's kicking in for real. And uh, you really want to start early on exercise and diet. And I think something like true nitrogen is a very, very, there may be other things coming. I, I don't know. But the, to me, this is a cornerstone uh, of, of uh, progress. And uh, right. everyone should take We have advantage. all the neurons that we're going to have, right? And we're trying to yeah, maintain know, our skeletal right. muscle mass. And, oh, and hell our yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Both I've heard the brain and the muscle mass. And it's, it's getting more challenging every year, even with true niagen. But, uh, but I'm convinced it has helped me along the way, and, and it is not cheap. I'm gonna, not going to kid anybody. I'm, I'm a little, I, I, but I, it, it, it is worth the expense, in my humble opinion. So, uh, I don't know about all the getting to a gram now. I'm gonna have to see if they look I get how them. young Dr. Drew yeah. looks. Well, whenever anybody says that, I've been on it long enough, Charlie, that I think to myself, I wonder if it's that that true niagen. Yeah, he's there. been taking it for a long time. Yeah, I think, a, I think we had you guys were a sponsor for the this life you live podcast in well, like actually, 10 years I, ago. I interviewed Charlie for the Dr. Drew podcast a long time ago. First time. We're going to have to look that up. But yeah. 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 No, you guys were, our, I think you were one of our sponsors for a well, short There time. was that too for that. But that was, that was after I was way, all right. Somebody's saying, should I take 150 or 300? I'm in my thirties. I would say 300 for sure. And as I'm talking to our, the, Dr. Brenner now, I'm I'm thinking 600 for me, maybe 900. Uh, so th that's where we're How at. How about me? You're the same as me. I need like 10 bottles then. I, I know. I went <laughs> uh, Charlie, anything else before I kind of wrap things up here? I, I feel like we've sort of run the run through the the basics. Yeah, I mean, so the, the older the, you get, the more you should have, the more you need. Is that how? It works? Not really. The, the key is the, more, the key is you know for 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 health healthy aging. Uh, repair is is really important, and um, the the data really strongly indicate initially from animal systems, but it's now being tested in humans. That um, and are supporting you know liver function. It's supporting um, heart function. The um, the differences between the the NAD precursors, the NR pathway gets jacked up when tissues are under metabolic stress. And so we Makes we think sense. that um, that <clears throat> during conditions of metabolic stress, your body is looking for NR. That's why it turns on the nicotinamide riboside kinase genes. And so you know we're very mm -hmm. happy that there's a safe form of NR that's available to people. And I'm I'm delighted that um, you and your listeners are aware of this product. Yep, and I'll keep pushing because I I just think this is a, I I. I there's too many. Um, we're too we're too metabolically unsound. We're too we're not we're not doing all the preventative things we should be doing to, to prevent chronic illness. That's so obvious to me now. Uh, all right, Dr. Brenner, thank you so much. Anything else uh, before you go? My pleasure. And um, uh, people can um, ask me questions on on Twitter at Charles M Brenner, and uh, they can look up our academic lab at BrennerLab.net. Beautiful. All right. Hope we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks so much. You bet it. Dr. Charlie Brenner, everybody. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I think it's Tess Laurie at 11 a.m. Pacific. Is that correct, everybody? Uh, maybe we'll throw up the schedule yes. here so I don't Let's get see. off. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's at 11 a.m. Pacific. Pay attention. Yes. 
Uh, out for a week, and then Brett Weinstein, Dave Rubin, Kevin Bass, Adam Carolla, Jimmy Fallon, Christine Anderson. We just got her rebooked. Fascinating. She is. Uh, look her up on Google and or and listen to some of her uh, uh, exciting. Uh, what should we call them? R rousing speeches. Uh, she's coming for you. Yeah, and this and, time we're gonna uh, try and get her on camera. Oh, was she off camera? There was just yeah, a picture of this time. Last time there was some sort of a tech issue connecting, but we're testing it all in advance so you can see her this time. So it'll be great. She was must very, have been a she was amazing must last been a time. Yeah, <laughs> solar flare. She yeah. was amazing. Must have been a solar flare, yes. <laughs> so, so, uh, and Caleb, Caleb, get your true niogen. I'm telling you, I, I am. Maybe get your wife in oh, too yeah. if we get her gaffed on board. Um, I know she likes supplements and things. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right, so... Yeah, it is. Uh, so here we are. Uh, we will be with you. It's pay attention. Eleven a.m. Pacific, two p.m. Uh, 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 Eastern, and that is on a Friday, which we normally don't have shows on Friday, because I will be out. It looks like I'll be out next week, although I have not had a final confirmation of that. Keep an eye on that schedule, and thank you all for being here. I've been watching you guys on your uh restream and of course on the rumble rants and you guys seem to like dr soon so maybe one day we'll get him back here again wasn't as it, well it was an amazing a, little amazing yes. coincidence there that we had a gigantic solar flare right at the beginning of the show and we had a solar flare expert on at the same time look at that i dug it i'm i'm curious how you knew it did you pick the it up on uh, Google, the uh, you know, people in the comments People in the comments told me, and I went and researched oh, it, and they wow. were right. So, yeah, thanks for the people in the comments keeping me up to date. It, uh, is that Restream, or where were they? They were on, I mean, some on YouTube and some on Rumble were leaving comments saying, oh, this just happened 40 minutes ago, and so I went and looked it up. So thanks to the audience Fabulous. for that one. Amazing. And I don't think we ever got uh, uh, into uh, onto Twitter, did we? I think that we sort of, right, the Twitter spaces never really came back. Now, maybe that was the solar flare that did that. So, <laughs> yes, all right. right, we didn't need it. We have, we have, we have plenty else going on. See y'all tomorrow, 11 a.m. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.